this is Miss Pounders, and I'll be reading the very last of the one and only Ivan with you. Pretending. The juvenile male approaches. He's eyeing my food hungrily. I imagine a different Ivan, my father's son. I grumble and swat and swagger. I beat my chest till the whole world hears. Kinyani watches, and so do the others. I move toward the young upstart, and he retreats, almost as if he believes I'm the silverback I'm pretending to be. I'm making a nest on the ground. It isn't a true jungle nest. The leaves are inferior and the sticks are brittle. They snap when I weave them into place. The others watch, grunting their disapproval. Too small, too flimsy, an ugly thing to see. But when I climb into that leafy cradle, it's like floating on treetop mist. Maya wants me to go back to my glass cage. I can tell, because she is tempting me toward the door with a trail of tiny marshmallows. I try to ignore her. I don't want to leave the outside. It's a cloudless day and I found just the right spot for a nap. But I relent when she adds some yogurt raisins to the trail. She knows my weaknesses all too well. In the glass cage, the TV is on. It's another nature show, jerky and unfocused. I expect to see gorillas, but none appear. I hear a shrill sound like a toy trumpet. My heart quickens. I rush close to the screen, and there she is, Ruby. She is rolling in a lovely pool of mud with two other young elephants. Another elephant approaches. She towers over Ruby. She strokes Ruby, nudges her. She makes soft noises. They stand side by side, just the way Stella and Ruby used to do. Their trunks entwine. I see something in Ruby's eyes, and I know what it is. It's joy. I watch the whole thing, and then Maya plays it again for me, and again. At last, she turns off the TV and carries it out of the cage. I put my hand to the glass. Maya looks over. Thank you, I try to say with my eyes. Thank you. Kenyani ambles toward me. She taps me on the shoulder and Knuckle runs away. I watch her, arms crossed over my chest. I'm careful not to make a sound. I'm not sure what we are doing. She ambles back, shoves at me, dashes past. And then I realize what hap what's happening. We're playing. We're playing tag. And I'm it. Make eye contact, show your form, strut, grunt, throw a stick, grunt some more, make some moves. Romance is hard work. It looks so easy on TV. I'm not sure I will ever get the hang of it. I wish Bob were here. I could use some advice. I try to recall all the romance movies we watched together. I remember the talking, the hugging, the face licking. I'm not very good at this, but it's fun trying. Is there anything sweeter than the touch of another as she pulls a dead bug from your fur? Gorillas aren't chatty like humans, prone to gossip and bad jokes. But now and again we swap a story under the sun. One day it's my turn. I tell my troop about Mac and Ruby and Bob and Stella and Julia and George, about my mother and father and sister. When I am done, they look away, silent. Kenyani moves closer, her shoulder brushes mine, and we let the sun soak into our fur together. I've explored every nook and cranny of this place, except for a hill at the far end where the workers have been repairing a wall. They're finally gone. They left behind fresh white brick and a mound of black dirt. While the others laze in the morning sun, I want to explore the hilltop. They've been there before, and I have not. Everything is still fresh to my eyes. I take my time going uphill, savoring the feel of the grass on my knuckles. The breeze carries the shouts of children and the drowsy hum of bumblebees. Near the top of the hill is a low-limbed tree, the kind that my sister would have loved. The wall is endless, clean and white, stretching far down to the habitats beyond my own. It's high and wide, carefully built to keep us in and others out. This is, after all still a cage. It rained last night and the pile of dirt is so soft to the touch. I scoop up a handful and breathe in the loamy snow. It's a rich brown color, heavy and cool in my palm, and the wall waits like an endless blank billboard. It's a big wall, but it's a big pile of dirt, and I'm a big artist. I slap handfuls of mud on the warm cement. I make a handprint. I tap my nose with a muddy finger. I make a nose print. I slide my palms up and down. The mud is thick and hard to use, but I keep moving and scooping and spreading. I don't know what I'm making, and I don't care. I make swoops and swirls and thick lines. 
Figures and shapes, light and shadow. I'm an artist at work. When I'm done, I step back to admire my work, but it's a large canvas and I'd like to get a better view. I go to the thick limbed tree and grab the lowest branch. I try to swing my legs. Oomph, I land hard. I'm too big to climb, I suppose. I try again anyway, and this time I pull myself onto the first limb, gasping for breath. One more limb, two, and I can't go any farther. Perched halfway up the tree, I see my troop, still dozing contentedly. I take in the wall, splattered and splashed with mud. Not much color, but lots of movement. I like it. It feels dreamy and wild, like something Julia might have made. From my seat in the tree, I can see beyond the wall. I see giraffes and hippos. I see deers with legs like delicate twigs. I see a bear, bear snoozing in a hollow log. I see elephants. She's far away, belly deep in tall grass with others by her side. Ruby. She's here, Stella, I whisper. Ruby's safe, just like I promised. I call to Ruby, but the wind tugs at my words, and I know she'll never hear me. Still, Ruby pauses for a second, her ears spread wide like tiny sails. Then, with lumbering grace, she moves on through the grass. It's a cloudy evening, chill and drizzly. Dinner is on its way, but I don't care. At night we sleep in our den, but I'm always the last to head inside. I've been inside long enough. This time of day, there aren't many visitors, just a few stragglers leaning on the wall that separates us. They point, take a couple of photos, then head over to near the nearby giraffes. One of the keepers is beck beckoning. Reluc reluctantly, I turn to go. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone running. I pause. It's a girl with dark hair lugging a backpack. A man follows behind, racing to catch up. Ivan, the girl yells. Ivan, it's Julia. I scramble to the edge of the wide moat that skirts the wall. Julia and George wave to me. I dash back and forth, hooting and grunting, doing a gorilla dance of happiness. Calm down, says a voice. You're behaving like a chimp. I freeze. A tiny, nut-brown, big-eared head pops out of Julia's backpack. Nice place, Bob says. Bob, I say, it's really you. In the flesh. How? Where? I can't seem to find any words. George's job at the zoo doesn't start till next month, so he and Julia made an agreement. She's walking three extra dogs to cover my food, and get this, they're all poodles. You said you didn't want a home, I say. Yeah, Bob says, but Julia's mom likes my company, so I figure I'm doing everybody a favor. It's a win-win. Julia pushes Bob's head back inside her backpack. You're not supposed to be here, she reminds him. Ivan looks great, doesn't he, Jules? George asks. Stronger, happier even. Julia holds up a little photo, but it's too far away for me to see. It's Ruby, Ivan. She's with the other elephants now, because of you. I know. I want to tell her. I saw with my own eyes. We stare across the expanse that separates us. After a while, George pats Julia's arm. Time to go, Jules. Julia gives a wistful smile. Bye, Ivan. Say hello to your new family, she turns to George. Thank you, Dad. For what? For, she gestures towards me. For this. They turn to leave. The lamps that light the zoo pathway blink on, blanketing the world with yellow light. I can just make out Bob's little head sticking out of Julia's backpack. You are the one and only Ivan, he calls. I nod and then turn toward my family, my life, my home. Mighty Silverback, I whisper.